Okay, this is a big one. Tonight on Mike Reads the World, we are discussing the oldest work of literature that we have as a text to read from pre-Columbian America. And I'm talking all the Americas, South, North, Central. This is the only one we have. How did this happen? How did this happen? You need some backstory before we begin. This uh, translation by Dennis Tedlock um, is excellent. I really enjoyed it, uh, and I would recommend it. Though I haven't tried any others except this Spanish, little Spanish one that I picked up. I will talk a little bit about that, that one as we go on. So, um, I'm going to start by quoting here from the introduction, which is also excellent, by the way. The authors of the alphabetic Popol Vuh were members of the three lordly lineages that had once ruled the Quiche Kingdom, or part of the Maya, what we call the Maya Empire, I guess, which isn't, I guess, really, a, it's a bunch of tribes. They worked in the middle of the 16th century, so just after Spanish colonization. And the scene of their writing was the town of Quiche, northwest of what is now Guatemala City, or Ciudad Guatemala. So yes, I'm counting it for Guatemala, which is, uh, you know, I could have read Miguel Angel Asturias, El Señor Presidente, and I probably will at some point, but I couldn't pass this one up. Uh, so yeah, you get the idea here. Some recently colonized or conquered um, Mayan tribe uh, nobles uh, had under the supervision of, of the Christian, you know, priests and, and whoever, had learned to write in, with Latin letters, their language, right? And so they uh, wrote in, in their own language uh, the story of an original book that the, the, was basically, it's, it's not enough to just say it was the Mayan Bible. It was Genesis, the Epic of Gilgamesh, the uh, I Ching, it was a tool for divination, it was a historical document of lineages, it was all these things combined into one original book, um, an, an original document that in the very first paragraphs of this book, the writers tell us that there was an original book. And they do not reveal its location. The author even speculates that they may have had access to it, but did not want to admit this so that it would not be destroyed by the Spanish. Uh, that is the reason we lost so many quipus in Peru. What a loss. Um, and the, the people who could read it. Uh, so don't say the Incas didn't have a language because they had the quipus, or a writing, a writing system, even though it wasn't a writing system, it was not. But, um, you know, besides the Dresden Codex, those, those codexes uh, that are spread throughout the world that are really more pictorial, so they're not, it's not like reading a text, they're just pictorial sort of, uh, kind of like the Egyptian Book of the Dead, I guess, but yeah, more pictorial even than that. Um, and then, and then uh, we have the quipus, so, so we have these fragments of, of writing, so to speak, from, from the pre-Columbian ancient world all over the Americas, but this is the only one that was in their own language from an original book written down uh, in time. So I can't stress the importance of that enough, uh, it, but it wasn't until 1700 that uh, a friar named Francisco Jimenez got a hold of this manuscript and made the only surviving copy of the Quiche text with a Spanish... Uh, so he actually wrote down uh, the whole Quiche version. We don't actually have that original that he was using. So he wrote on one side the Quiche and the other side his Spanish translation. So uh, thanks to this friar, we... This is this is what everyone uses to translate the Popol Vuh today, is this original document that this friar made and translated. So um, so this, this Popol Vuh that I have here in Spanish is not that original Spanish translation by the friar. It is a new translation that the, um, the translator 
was working off of the quiche written on this, you know, what's shown in the facsimile here. So, um, yeah, that is kind of the history of how the story of how we got the Popo Vu. It's a it's a little bit iffy. I mean, we have to kind of take the the writers on the word that this is an original book in writing in ancient writing um and they say the one who reads and assesses it has a hidden identity they don't say that the book itself is hidden they say that the one who reads and assesses it has a hidden identity very interesting um and they're doing this of course all under the supervision vision uh, um, as they say, amid the preaching of God in Christendom now. But that is the last time Christendom will be mentioned in this entire book. That is simply a one-page introduction. Um, so at this point, I'm just going to go right into talking about the uh, an overview of the five parts of the Popol Vuh, but before, I want to just say one thing about translations. If you are looking at other translations, I noticed that in this Spanish translation, uh, many names were just written phonetically in the original Quiche. So, for example, we have like Balam Quiche, um, and I would never know if it were not for this. In this English translation, he translated as as uh, Jaguar Kitze. So Balam means Jaguar. It's much easier for me to remember a character named Jaguar than Balam, which is a word I have no idea what it means. So I actually prefer how this uh, translator, um, Dennis Tedlock, does it, actually translating the meaning of the names um, instead of using the original uh, word, I suppose, uh, Latinized. So, um, yeah, let's start talking about the Popol Vuh. So the Popol Vuh is divided into five sections. The first one is a Genesis story. There's the creation of animals from, you know, the world is just dark sea and dark sky, so they create the animals, they create... There's several failed attempts at creating humans, and humans do not actually get created until the fourth part of the book. So you still, we still have some to go. In the Genesis story, humans, there's, we fail to create humans. And then in parts two and three, we get stories of these two god uh, heroes who um, are gonna end up going head to head with this sort of um, citadel of uh, death gods. It's really, really fun. Um, so the, uh, the second part, we meet these two heroes, uh, Spelanke and Hunapu. They kind of take down some false gods, I want to call them, or they're sort of like, they're, they're represented by animals, like the seven macaw, the, um, the Cayman or Kaiman god, who is one of the sons of seven macaw, and the other son of seven macaw, who is Earthquake. So basically our, our two heroes who are gods um, tame these sort of uh, forces that are starting to think they're super powerful. And it's, it's funny because Earthquake as a god, right? You would think this thing has the power to destroy the entire world, but the reason it can shake the world but doesn't destroy it is because Spelanke and uh, Hunapu actually put him down in his place uh, under the earth um, so that, uh, that he couldn't... Um, cause further dis destruction. So, uh, and then the third part is actually the story of how these two god heroes came to be. And this is uh, where it starts getting really good. You know, you can almost, I, I don't recommend doing it, but you can almost start with part three and just read part three and four as their own story. But I mean, part one and two are short enough that I'm just saying it starts getting really good at part three and four. And those are also the longest sections of the Popol Vuh. Um, so, uh, yeah, this, uh, this, we go back in time to one Hunapu and seven Hunapu, two other brothers. These aren't, these aren't the two heroes, right? But they're gonna be connected. So they play ball all day, they throw dice, and then they get a summons from the death gods of Sibalba. Sibalba seems to be kind of uh, this sort of de citadel of death. 
And somewhere in the notes of this book, it said that actually the Milky Way is supposed to be like the road to Sibalba. And the road to Sibalba is described in all these different colors, uh, different color roads. Um, but yeah, so there are 12 different lords of Sibalba and uh, <laughs> they're in pairs. So you have like the Demon of Pus and Demon of Jaundice, the Bone Scepter and Skull Scepter, the Demon of Filth and Demon of Woe, Wing and Pack Strap. Uh, yeah, so, you know, they summon these two brothers because they just observed them playing ball, the, the Mayan ball game. So there's, in these sections, there's a ton of references to that, like, uh, Mesoamerican um, ball game. You probably know what I'm talking about, like those courts and you weren't allowed to touch it with your hands. It was basically, you know, soccer, uh, a mix of soccer and like, I don't know. I don't know. What is that? A basketball? A mix of soccer and basketball? So, um, yeah, it's, but look it up if you don't, if you don't know, it's pretty cool. Um, so the, the messengers of one and seven death, um, go to them and say that you have to come see these, uh, these death lords. And so they do. And, uh, this basically they fail a test and, uh, and get sacrificed. <laughs> so, um, and one of them gets decapitated and his head goes, um, on a tree and, um, becomes like the, the fruit of this tree, which is a, uh, calabash, a calabash fruit. And, uh, and so then a blood, there's, there's a maiden who's the daughter of one of these death lords named Blood Gatherer. So, uh, this daughter is named Blood Moon. Uh, she goes out to the garden one day because she hears that the fruit of this tree is sweet. Interesting uh, Garden of Eden comparison here, maybe. So she goes out and sees uh, this fruit, which is the decapitated head of the of the um, the uh, hunapu, and uh, she gets this some of some saliva from this head impregnates her. And then, uh, and then she um, ends up uh, having to trick, well, she gets some help, but she has to escape her way out of getting sacrificed so that she can actually give birth to the two brothers, the two twins, uh, who are going to be our heroes. Those, <laughs> I told you we'd come back to it. The Spelanke and Hunapu of part two, who defeated like Earthquake and in the, in the Seven Macaw and everything. So, um yeah, they all come out uh, fine, and uh, but then they eventually get summoned by these gods of death themselves in the next section. Uh, so they have to go and try to uh, overcome the challenges that their father, um, who is still uh, a little fruit head on a tree, um, could not overcome. And uh, there's there's this really creepy description of the of the different houses that they have to do the different trials in. Like there's the bat house, the cold house, the jaguar house, the fire house, and uh, you really I don't know I just I really got this sense of like like uh, I don't know almost uh, I I don't I don't have anything to compare it to. See that's. That's the really powerful thing about reading a book like this. It's just, yeah, it's it's like reading the Epic of Gilgamesh or the I Ching or something so old from a culture that's so different from your own. I mean, of course, I'm uh, I'm talking as someone who grew up very much in what we call Western culture in the Abrahamic religions. So just seeing these, you know, reading about these cosmovisions but also recognizing the, the human similarities in the stories. Um, but also that like just these ideas about death and sacrifice seem so, uh, so different. And um, anyway, so after, spoiler, you know, uh, who, if <laughs> Hunapu and uh, um, so, uh, the, uh, the two twins, basically they, they uh, defeat these death gods through this kind of convoluted, they have to kind of die and then be reborn. There's a sort of like Messiah uh, uh, being reborn part to this. 
and then they actually sacrifice uh, some of the gods. And uh, that sacrifice is all is all in this. They they play that they play that Mayan uh, ball game with the gods, uh, losing several times, but then finally, um, I don't know if they win or <laughs> exactly what happens. Um, I don't want to get into it. You'll have to read it yourself. It's, I mean, it, I don't want to just describe the whole book, right? I'm just telling you about some stuff that happens as it comes up, and I think of it. Um, and then the fourth part, <clears throat> part four, so we're over halfway through now, is, is the uh, beginning of the conception of humans. So uh, we get, we get uh, some prisoners, the 400 boys that were killed by the Kaiman god, Zipakna, in, in part two. They go up into the, into the sky and create the stars and... Uh, these two twins actually become the sun and moon. So part three is basically the myth of how the entire cos cosmology, the, the stars, the sun, and the moon were created by these two twins and the, uh, the boys that they rescued from the, the citadel um, of the death gods, Zibalba. So, uh, well, actually, from uh, from Zipakna, I guess. I don't know where exactly they were. I might be confusing one detail there, but it's it's not terribly important. Um, part four, humans are born. And here's where we get the names of the first people who were made. We have Jaguar Kitze, Jaguar Knight, Dark Jaguar, and Not Right Now. Yeah, I'm not even kidding. Can't make this stuff up. It's so we have three jaguars and not right now. Okay, so then we have uh, we get some women made, you know, for these uh, these four handsome men, and they are Red Sea Turtle, the wife of Jaguar Kitze, Prawn House, the wife of Jaguar Knight, Water Hummingbird. The wife of not right now, and Macaw House, the wife of Dark Jaguar. So these are the first eight people, and uh, <clears throat> from them, they get people kind of divide off into different houses, and um, you know we get uh, they go to a mountain. There's the geography is referenced, and there's a map in this book that kind of places where these these things are, like the citadels. Um, the mountains, Tulan Zuaya, seven caves, seven canyons. So the book does give you that. I never felt a need to reference the map once. I don't know why I just kind of didn't feel the need. Um, there's the story of how they first generate fire. And then some other tribes kind of come out of nowhere. Like I thought these were the only people on earth. So I must have forgot or missed a detail. But then these, uh, there's, there's these uh, tribes that come basically asking for fire. They don't want to give fire away without something in return. So we have we have a myth here related to fire, and there's even a part where the fire has to be stolen. Another strange similarity to uh, ancient Greek mythology. Um, but I'll let you discover the, the details of that one for yourself. Um, and uh, yeah, so... Joining together all the tribes, the tribes join together. Um, yeah, this is basically, part four is basically how do all these tribes get united? There's a big battle. There's a big battle where uh, the tribes all try to attack uh, Jaguar Kitze, Jaguar Knight, not right now, and Dark Jaguar. Um, they uh, use a trap of, of uh, swarms of insects and yellow jackets and wasps to... Uh, uh, basically um, defeat this army as they're attacking their citadel. And um, then we get the death of these four first humans. And then chapter five is mostly just lineage and history. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting because it's like each chapter, it gets kind of more and more realist. 
but it doesn't it doesn't really start getting anywhere close to realist until of course humans are created but it's like the last the last chapter is the most like historical based and also i think kind of the most the most boring but <laughs> that's just me maybe somebody will find it really interesting but the uh the first four chapters really knocked me out were really really fantastic uh and uh, exciting and interesting and uh, to read and, and kind of mind-blowing, kind of mind-blowing just um, trying to put myself in the headspace of these, you know, people that uh, the, the pre-Columbians the, uh, of um, Central America and, and yeah, just their, their relationship to life and death. Um, I found myself thinking a lot about sort of the, the human, the way humans sacrifice or the sacrifice among the gods is presented in this book and um, thinking a lot too about how their, the vision of the gods is one that seems much more to me uh, closer to the reality we live in. The gods seem to be, to almost have it out uh, f like the the death gods of Zibalba, they're almost adversaries of humanity, or are they more false gods? I never I never really got a sense in this book that there was any personal connection with a higher power that wasn't fallible. Like there's no there's no god in this book that is infallible. There's no um, overarching kind of benevolent god. Certainly. There's no overarching God that communicates with humanity and tells them what to do. Um, there's this adversarial nature uh, with the gods, but also this kind of acceptance that even, like, you can defeat the death gods, but, like, death is still going to get you. Uh, but, um, it, and, uh, I mean, even, even the two twins die, essentially. They just become the sun and, uh, the, sun and the moon. Uh, from from what I understood, so uh, it's I don't know. It's it's just trying to wrap my head around this is obviously really um, I don't know that I'm saying anything particularly insightful here, but hopefully hopefully I got you interested in um, reading the Popol Vuh. Uh, I am of course I I feel like I should have a big disclaimer anytime I'm talking about anything even somewhat intellectual that I'm not a scholar. I'm not any kind of uh, <laughs> academic or and never have been uh, so it's just kind of my uh, my experiences and interpretations so um, I don't know it was I think I think I'll stop here just because you know the more I say the more inaccurate things I'll probably say but I hope I've given you a good overview um, I didn't, I didn't really give you a good idea of that last chapter, did I? So yeah, it, it's really just lists of houses, and um, it kind of seems like the clans, and there was some of this that I saw at Easter Island too, or heard about at Easter Island, that uh, the clans were kind of divided up by their, their position, or, or every clan sort of had a role to fill in society. Like here it talks about how, um, how the different houses of, uh, of a citadel will be in charge of like the ball courts or the temples or this or that. So I thought that was kind of interesting too um, in the fifth section. But the fifth, the fifth section is really just kind of, it's, it's the glue of society. It's the glue of Mayan society. It's the lineages. <coughs> Excuse me, my voice is getting a little, a little tired from, from this video, I guess. Uh, so the, the, yeah, it's just this sort of, you know, lineages and the houses and, and roles in society and uh, and um, that's yeah that's really all it is so all right have a good night thanks for watching and we'll see you next time on Mike reads the world